thanks again. I appreciate the uh, opportunity to get up here twice. You guys haven't had enough of me yet. Um, so I want to talk again somewhat practically uh, about how we think about when to use immunotherapy. And I'll start this by saying we, we really don't know yet. But we're going to talk about the ways we can do it and how things might go forward and just point out this is an area of active research that we really do need to learn more about. So the themes of my talk today are going to be to try to identify the times in treatment when immunotherapy could be given, review rational combinations of immunotherapies with other treatments, and I know that's a question that's come up a couple of times, and to discuss factors that might suggest whether or not the immunotherapy will work, and we refer to them as biomarkers. And so this will be a good add-on from the talk that you just heard. So uh, before I get started, it was suggested that maybe it would be a good idea to just talk about what the available immunotherapies for each of the three cancers that we were focusing on today are. So for melanoma, there are cytokines interferon alpha and interleukin-2, and antibodies ipilimumab and pembrolizumab. In kidney cancer, the cytokines include interferon alpha and interleukin-2, and the antibodies include bevacizumab. And in lung cancer, there are antibodies that are approved, including bevacizumab, um, the following two are not approved, although there's clinical trial data that suggests that they could have efficacy, including cetuximab and ramucirumab. So what are the different settings in which we could give immunotherapy? And the first of these that we could talk about is neoadjuvant therapy, or essentially therapy we would give prior to definitive surgery. So I want to get all the lingo down here so we don't get lost in terms of what we're talking about. At the bottom of this figure, you see a clinical trial design of a neotherapy approach to the treatment of breast cancer. This was a, a fam now famous trial called the NEO-ALTO trial. And basically what you can see is in the trial, patients got randomized to different arms, they got different kinds of chemotherapy, then they all got surgery, and then got more treatment. So the neoadjuvant part was they were treated before the surgery to see if that could help uh, improve the quality of the surgery with the goal of shrinking the tumor before surgery in hopes of increasing the likelihood of a complete resection. Adjuvant therapy would be therapy after surgery. So the goal here would be to generate an immune response that could destroy any remaining cells after the patient had already had surgery. And here you see a clinical trial designed for an adjuvant therapy study where all the patients have resection of the tumor, then they get randomized and they get various different kinds of chemotherapy to see which one's best after surgery. And finally, there's treatment in the recurrent setting. And the goal here is to try to induce the immune system to try to get the cancer that's spread back under control in the hopes of inducing a complete and long-lasting tumor response. So those are really the three areas uh, we could uh, see the uh, utility of immunotherapy in the future. It's important to sort of point out again that um, this is a complicated process. So you heard earlier that the adaptive immune response, the T and B cells, are very specific for different infectious and cancer molecules, and up to about uh, 2.5 times 10 to the seventh number of molecules can be um, observed or can be recognized by the immune system. In the situation where you're treating not too much cancer, that can be really important, and we're going to talk about that here in a little bit. But this is a, uh, some data from the National Cancer Institute where they used cells that they isolated that were specific to the molecule in the cancer, and they were able to infuse them in the patient and get the cancer to shrink, and when the cancer started to grow again, shrink again. So they were able to get the actual cell that was specific to the tumor and infuse it. So the immune system has to be able to see the cancer molecule in order to mount that immune response. So these cells were specific for that kind of cancer. But if only single cells are available to the immune system, they may not just not see it. There may just not be enough cancer cells left. And that could influence whether or not you would want to give the immunotherapy before or after uh, surgery. Larger tumors have millions of cancer cells. Uh, so that you might propose that would, that would make it more likely that the immune system could see that. But and we saw earlier from Dr. Atkins that if um, immune cells are able to traffic into the tumor, you're more likely to have a potential benefit. Then at the same time, however, the tumor makes molecules that can allow it to escape from the um, immune system and therefore may dampen the immune response. So again, we don't know the answer to this, and all of these questions are sort of floating in our head and could influence the results of clinical trials in the future when we think about whether or not this is a good approach. And I'm going to go back and just explain this one more time as well. How does the immune system actually uh, respond? There are essentially, I, I'm breaking it down into three simplistic categories, but basically the danger signal has to alert the immune system, and those antigen-presenting cells or dendritic cells have to notice and take up the antigens from the cancer. Those then need to go, those dendritic cells need to go to the lymph node and show that to the other immune cells, the T cells, and those T cells then need to go back and try to kill the cancer. 
okay? And this can get disrupted in a lot of different ways, and all these different pieces have to work. So what would the pros and cons be of these different approaches? So the first one we talked about was a neoadjuvant approach, in other words, treatment before surgery. So before surgery, the pros could be to allow evaluation of the response of the treatment before the surgery. In other words, is the treatment shrinking the tumor, suggesting that maybe it would work later? Could it reduce the amount of tumor that has to be resected at surgery? So you could just imagine that a, a smaller surgery is better than a larger surgery. And could it possibly even kill the, any cells that had already gotten away? At the same time, any cells that had gotten away may have different mutations that you've heard so much about. And so if you mount an immune response against the primary tumor, it may be that that works and yet still doesn't treat those cells that already got away. So I'll, I'll show you a neoadjuvant uh, study in bladder cancer that's rather famous at this point. This is a study done at the MD Anderson uh, where patients with bladder cancer were diagnosed. They initially were treated actually with ipilimumab for a dose. And they were able to collect blood from those patients to try to look at, are we seeing activation of the immune system? All those patients then went underwent surgery, so they could then compare this biopsy to this surgical specimen and see, did the immune cells go into the, uh, into the tumor or not? And then they were able to continue to follow those patients over time. So this sort of study design is really great for generating the kind of data we talked about. It was just alluded how a lot of trials in the metastatic setting are requiring biopsies at baseline and on treatment. This is an avenue for which we could get a lot of data in the context of standard practice. So obviously, patients are going to get diagnosed, and they're going to get surgery. So this is a way to sort of encapsulate all of that and collect more information. And what they found in this study was that um, treatment with ipilimumab in these uh, uh, patients with bladder cancer was able to upregulate a number of molecules, one of which of particular interest is a molecule called ICOS, which is number one of those break switches. Um, and is another target for cancer uh, immunotherapy drug development. I'll also just highlight this trial. This is an ongoing trial at the MD Anderson right now. And in this trial, patients who have kidney cancer are screened for the trial. They are randomized to three arms where they get different immunotherapies, anti-PD-1 with nivolumab, anti-PD-1 with anti-VEGF with nivolumab and bevacizumab, or anti-PD-1 and anti-CTLA-4 with nivolumab and ipilimumab. All patients get surgery, and then they all get anti-PD-1 thereafter. So you can just imagine the wealth of information that we can get from this sort of approach where you can compare all these different tumor specimens. You know, obviously, everybody who's a patient in this room realizes we collect a lot of blood. Uh, we can analyze all of that in the context of our treatment and hopefully predict which of these therapies could be the best in the future. So what about immunotherapy after surgery? What would the pros and cons of that be? So a pro would be that you, know, you didn't potentially get a treatment that delayed your surgery, because obviously we want to get a treatment that didn't work and then your cancer got worse before your surgery. Uh, we may actually be able to tailor any subsequent treatment based on what we find in your surgical specimen. So there might be characteristics about your tumor that which you might find that might suggest that a, tumor in the, a treatment in the future might help. The cons, however, are that you know, maybe you didn't need anything more than surgery. So if you get treatment after surgery, Maybe you get a side effect, and you never needed that treatment anyway, and the surgery had cured the tumor. Also, it may be that there's a limited amount of that tumor antigen floating around, and the immune system isn't able to mount a response against it because it's just not enough of it there. Um, and there's a, also sort of an open-ended question with some immunotherapies. Um, if they really work, do you need to give them after surgery, or can you wait until the tumor does come back? Because if the immune system really works, and we all believe it does, but it should work later too. So, but I'll highlight that this is quite complicated. So there have been, a, for a long time, there have been attempts to try to harness the immune system in the adjuvant setting, because it was thought if there was less cancer, there would be less of those inhibitory mechanisms in place. So in lung cancer, I'm highlighting a trial here uh, of a vaccine approach directed towards a molecule called MAGE3. And you don't have to obviously memorize all the details here, but suffice it to say that they randomized patients, they made sure that the tumor actually had MAGE3 in them, they started to vaccinate the patients, and they, they could tell they were getting a vaccine response against this MAGE3 molecule. The phase two trial looked pretty good, but unfortunately, even though they had the right protein and they had the vaccination and it looked like it was working, the patients didn't live any longer because of it. And that may go back to the specificity of the response that we need. Again, everybody's tumor's a little bit different with different mutations, and everybody's immune response, if it's gonna work, needs to be specific for your own body or for that patient's body. In melanoma, we've had some recent success, we think, um, with ipilimumab in the adjuvant setting. I'm gonna go over that data, but again, highlight how it's a little bit nuanced. 
So the, this was recently reported at ASCO this year of using ipilimumab at 10 milligrams per kilogram in the adjuvant setting. So high-risk melanomas were randomized to either get induction therapy with ipilimumab or to get a placebo. Uh, and then went on, got the four doses, and then went on to get maintenance therapy thereafter. This is the um, relapse-free survival curve, and I'll just highlight, maybe I will, there we go, um, that this was a positive trial, meaning that it reached a st statistical significance that it took longer for the patients who got ipilimumab to have a recurrence of melanoma than those patients who got placebo. So that sounds great, right? So we should start doing this, right? Well, what were the downsides? Well, the downside was that patients who got the ipilimumab got a lot more side effects. And when we're talking about giving treatment, you know, a number of treatments that patients get in the metastatic setting for cancer, we tolerate side effects because we're dealing with cancer that's growing in our bodies. In the adjuvant setting, you don't have cancer. So if you get a bad side effect, you may not be quite so enthusiastic about the treatment. So half the patients came off of this clinical trial because they had side effects from ipilimumab. One interesting feature of this trial was that we found that the number of patients receiving more than one maintenance dose, so again, the standard treatment is four doses, the number of patients that went on to receive another dose afterwards was only 42% of the patients. And you remember that this was a positive trial, so it did take longer for the melanoma to come back, which actually to me suggests that maybe those four doses are actually what patients need in order to get the benefit. So that is a useful thing that comes out of these kinds of data. But again, I'll highlight that if you had your melanoma resected, there was a percentage risk that it wasn't going to come back. And if you were one of the people who had severe colitis, 7.6%, or the development of hypophysitis and you need to take steroid replacement the rest of your life, or you had liver toxicity, you may not be quite as enthusiastic about it. So these are nuanced issues and we have to consider them carefully. So just because we can give a drug doesn't mean we necessarily should give a drug. And it needs to be discussed with your oncologist and we need to interpret these kind of data carefully. So what about treatment um, of unresectable cancer? So after your surgery, unfortunately, the tumor does come back. What about that situation? And I would just point out that, and I think all would agree with me, at the time of a recurrence, the first thing to do is stop and think about what's important here. What are the goals of care? What are the family issues? What are the patient's expectations about what we're gonna do? And discuss those clearly with the doctor instead of just diving into the treatment first. In terms of treatment, how should immunotherapy be given in relationship to other treatments? Should we give it before chemotherapy, during chemotherapy, or after? Uh, a number of combination approaches have been tried with targeted therapy agents, as well as chemotherapy and radiation. And there are many more in development. Again, all the standard drugs that are avail available. Some of these combinations could include targeted therapies like BRAF, VEGF, or EGFR inhibitors, specific to whichever kind of cancer you may be uh, dealing with, melanoma, kidney cancer, or a lung cancer. Uh, and chemotherapy uh, has been proposed that some may have immunological properties that might also stimulate the immune response. And finally, radiation approaches have also been highlighted in this meeting already. I'm gonna go over some of them already. So there's been a lot of success lately in the development of targeted therapy drug development, and we're at this meeting today discussing immunotherapeutic development. So we think maybe in the future going forward, we could use immunotherapy to try to get the host or the person to respond to the tumors, and at the same time give drugs that are very specific to go after the cancer. So doesn't that sound great? It seems like the best of all worlds, right? Well, it hasn't been quite that simple, and I'm gonna use melanoma as a, um, I guess I said an archetypal example. I was feeling good when I wrote this, huh? So in melanoma, this is a really, really important signaling pathway. So when the melanoma grows, it sends signals down through this, these proteins, to grow further. And as the patients who have melanoma will know, about half of patients with melanoma have a mutation in a gene called BRAF, most commonly BRAF V600E. And the dr first drug development to go after that was a drug called Vemurafenib, which is a pill that you can take that works quite well. Here's the waterfall plot. These are all individual patients showing how much their cancer shrunk when they took Vemurafenib. And you can see that some of them, it went away entirely. And there's a gradient here in terms of how much response there was. Now, unfortunately, the median progression-free survival, how long this works, is on average about six months, six to seven months. And even with next generation approaches, it's about 10 months. So that's somewhat in contrast to the immunotherapeutic approaches that we saw earlier, where the response rates maybe aren't quite as high, but you have the potential to induce a long-term response. So wouldn't it be great? Give the drug, shrink it, give immunotherapy, lengthen it. So what happened, oh, there's further uh, rationale for giving these two drugs as together as well. We noticed in patients who got Vemurafenib at first, if you did a biopsy of their tumor, soon after they started on the BRAF inhibitor, we actually saw that immune cells trafficked into the tumor. 
So blocking the BRAF gene with the targeted therapy seemed to make the immune cells notice the cancer more. That's shown here, where you can see that uh, CD8 cells are those T cells we keep talking about. And here, you don't have a lot of them. You start the BRAF inhibitor, all this brown are the immune cells that trafficked in there. We also know that when in cell line models in the laboratory, if you induce the cells to be resistant to the BRAF inhibitor, you actually get upregulation of PDL1. So there's definitely crosstalk between these pathways that we target with targeted therapies and these immunotherapeutic approaches for cancer. So again, it seems like a no-brainer that we would combine these. Unfortunately, it wasn't that simple. So the first phase one trial that tried to combine ipilimumab with vemurafenib had to be closed because the patients developed liver toxicity. And this is the, from the um, report in the New England, Medical, uh, New England Journal of Medicine, essentially outlining that patients' liver enzymes went up quite high pretty fast after getting the two drugs together. So is this an ipilimumab problem? Was this a BRAF inhibitor problem? Well, we're not really sure. There's been a further trial done combining dabrafenib and trametinib and ipilimumab. And for those with, know that with melanoma, this is the standard BRAF approach now. But this trial had to be closed for colonic perforations. In other words, it seemed worsened ipilimumab toxicity. So again, is this an ipilimumab problem or a kinase inhibitor problem? We're not sure. It is of interest that dabrafenib plus trametinib does appear to be somewhat safer. Uh, these were the toxicities that patients experienced. And uh, unfortunately, two patients who got the combination had development of holes in their colon from ipilimumab. So we commonly don't combine these two treatments together at this time, and we're not clear on how to use them. Um, in kidney cancer, there's been a somewhat similar experience. So there was a phase one trial done of sunitinib, the VEGFR inhibitor, with tremilimumab, which is a sort of a sister molecule to ipilimumab. This is the toxicity profile that was described in that clinical trial, and I won't go through it all except to say that this is bad. These are all toxicities. And what was found was that um, in the patient's kidneys, there was immune infiltration that caused kidney damage. And it's not clear why, but giving these targeted kinase inhibitors seemed to somehow agitate or irritate the response of the immunotherapy. So again, ipilimumab problem, sunitinib problem, we're not sure. So trying to tease this out is a big interest of ours in the medical research field now, because perhaps you can't give them together and you gotta give them in sequence. So we've gone forward, and this is a clinical trial that I developed through the National Cancer Institute, and I'm just highlighting it for the sake of the, the schema. And you can see here, we're giving people dabrafenib, trametinib, or trametinib, or dabrafenib, or no, no, no treatment, and then giving everybody IPI, and then seeing how this goes. So perhaps you have to give them in sequence in different orders instead of giving them at the same time. What about PD-1 or PD-L1 antibodies? Well, we know that they're less toxic. So is it possible that you could give them more easily in combination with other drug treatments? Um, we know that this PD-L1 expression is influenced by these oncogenes, such as BRAF and EGFR. So there are a lot of ongoing clinical trials to try to sort this out. And I put this table to highlight just the fact that we see multiple myeloma, melanoma, renal cell, non-small cell lung cancer, all kinds of different tumors. We're trying to combine these different therapies. We just don't know the best way to do it yet. What about chemotherapy? Someone asked a question, and I answered it when I was sitting up here earlier. It's been described that some chemotherapies may induce immunological cell death. And so what does that mean? Well, it could influence the immune system in some sort of way. So some chemotherapies you may have heard of, like gemcitabine, oxaliplatin, cyclophosphamide, they may influence the maturation of certain immune cells, such as dendritic cells, and facilitate antigen presentation, so they're more likely to show the immune cells that they'll uh, be able to prime the cancer. Uh, there are other uh, treatments, such as cyclophosphamide, which seem to have specific treatment effect on some of these T regulatory cells, which are some of the normal cells in your body that actually dampen your immune response. So it's theoretically possible that these drugs could be used in combination or sequence with immunotherapies. Again, we're not entirely sure. Radiation is another area that's of interest, uh, and this is from a famous paper uh, published by Dr. Wolchuk's group, in which a patient got ipilimumab therapy and had disease here, 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 and as they went through, it appeared that the therapy wasn't having the desired effect as the cancers were getting bigger. The patient went on to see radiation treatment to a back, a, a spinal metastasis that was symptomatic, and thereafter, despite maintenance therapy, the tumor started to go away. So is it possible that radiation to that one site of a disease somehow flipped things over so that the immune system was able to go further? And there's a lot of preclinical or laboratory data that suggests that radiation may be synergistic with immunotherapy. 
And this is, uh, again, to highlight that this is an active area of research in the, in the field. This is only a sampling of all the clinical trials that are going on combining radiation with immunotherapy. This is actually just ipilimumab trials. The numbers are going off the charts for PD-1 trials as well. So in terms of combination therapies, uh, I think we're still very early in the development of these approaches. Um, the future is probably in combinations, although it's not entirely clear which is which. Um, you know, we could think about combining multiple inhibitory pathways, such as CTLA-4 and PD-1. You could think about combining uh, PD-1, CTLA-4 with uh, VEGF or blood vessel blockers. You could combine it with vaccines or other immune stimulants, with radiation, with chemotherapies, and finally with adoptive T-cell transfer or CAR T-cells, those cells I alluded to which have already been sort of designed to be able to go and find the cancer. So very quickly at the end, I'm just going to try to uh, discuss quickly. Someone asked a question about which uh, can we predict who is likely to benefit from treatment with immunotherapy, and I was a little um, I, I sort of hedged on you there, and I said I, I don't really know. Well, I'm going to show you sort of some information that suggests that we know a little bit, but not enough yet to really tell us exactly what to do. Some of those areas are evaluating some of the other immune cells, such as the uh, absolute lymphocyte count, looking in the tumor microenvironment to see if there are factors there that would suggest to us whether or not this is going to work the PDL1 status, and whether or not, just globally speaking, it looks like the tumor has been recognized or not. So these are data uh, from Sloan Kettering and then from a, 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 a joint effort that we had when I was at the Dana-Farber, looking at patients who were treated with ipilimumab, and it's quite clear that patients um, who have a higher absolute lymphocyte count after seven weeks of treatment appear to have a better outcome. This needs to be validated in larger data sets, uh, but it is of some interest. There are a number of factors in the tumor microenvironment that potentially uh, influence the activity. I'm not going to read all of these. I put them up there just to suggest to you that we're working on this. There are things that we can find. The problem is that these are easier and more difficult to actually look at. I'm going to highlight 2,3-dolamine uh, dioxygenase, which is an enzyme that can be secreted in the microenvironment. And suffice it to say, this is an important enzyme that uh, works on T cell uh, activity, uh, and it's expressed in a number of different uh, tissues. A drug has been developed to try to block this enzyme that's called IDO. That drug is called endoximode. And there was a clinical trial done of combining it with ipilimumab. And I'll just show here that this shows that this seems to make ipilimumab work better in combining it with this. So perhaps we can learn by looking in the tumor what other factors we could add in. What about the PD-1 status? You heard about this already. We would heard earlier that PDL1 uh, positivity co-localizes with immune cells that can get to the cancer but can't really figure out how to kill it. And I'll just highlight that in the trials so far, we've seen that patients who are PD-L1 negative, so patients who don't have expression, expression can still have resist responses, meaning more than 30% tumor shrinkage. And that was from the Genentech antibody. This is from the Merck antibody, where I highlight that these are patients who have significant benefit from the drug where the biomarker is negative. So it's clearly not a good biomarker yet. Um, it is, however, predictive that it's more likely that you will benefit if it's present, but it shouldn't be used as a selection factor prior to treatment at this time. And finally, I'll just state that perhaps we need a more global profile of the tumor. We, you know, we've talked quite a bit about whether or not the tumor cell gets recognized, and if we see in the tumor that there are a lot of immune cells and all these other properties, it can suggest to us that this treatment might work. If they don't have this, perhaps that means we should try a different treatment, and we're working on ways to be able to identify that at this time. So in conclusion, at the current time, it's not clear exactly when the best time to give immunotherapy would be, and there are different uh, uh, hypotheses as to why one might be better than another. This actually could be different between different types of immunotherapy, as well as the specific circumstances of the patient. Um, we're developing predictive factors of treatment success, so we call them biomarkers, and they'll be very important in helping to determine which treatment to get next. And finally, I just want to emphasize that despite all of this great uh, achievement and all these advances that we've talked about today, Clinical trials are essential to better understand which approach is best for patients at which time in their treatment. Thank you very much.